diver propulsion vehicles, DPVs, scooters, whatever you call them. They're the motorcycles, pickup trucks, and space shuttles of the underwater world. In other words, they're fun, useful, and increasingly important for pushing the envelope in tech diving. But while scooters are fun, useful, and sometimes necessary, like any form of specialized diving, they have some considerations. In the PADI Diver Propulsion Vehicle Specialty course, your PADI instructor will teach you the skills and knowledge you need to get the most enjoyment out of DPV diving, to get years of service from your DPV, and to avoid some of the pitfalls and safety issues related to using them. If you've not used a DPV before, you may wonder why you'd use one, except perhaps for the most obvious reason, they're fun. But a second reason for using a scooter is that with many models, they let you cover a wider area and see more on a dive. You'll especially like this at larger sites, like wrecks. A third reason for using a DPV is that it reduces your exertion significantly. This saves you air, so you not only see a wider area, but you stay down to see it longer. For this reason also, Scootering may be a good way to get around if you have a physical challenge. Before we get into how to use DPVs, let's start by looking at the three basic types and features available. Compact scooters are the smallest, lightest, and lowest cost. Although these models don't go much faster than you can swim, they still reduce your effort and air use. You can easily carry them a reasonable distance, and they're easier to travel with. Recreational scooters are the most generally popular. They're fast, reasonably portable, and moderately priced. You can usually get two or more no-stop single-cylinder dives out of a single charge. Most of these models have speeds in the 2 to 5 kilometers per hour or 1 to 3 miles per hour range. That may not sound fast, but it's much faster than you can swim for more than a short distance. Technical DPVs get their name from tech diving, which is where you see them used most to assist divers with substantial equipment loads. Their speed range is about the same as recreational DPVs, but they can go significantly farther on a single charge. They're very rugged and rated to deeper depths than most recreational models. They're large to accommodate their big batteries, which is something you need to consider as part of your dive preparation. Although technical DPVs grew out of tech diving, they have a growing following with serious recreational divers. Most DPVs are the pulling type that you ride behind or over with handles, and often a toe strap though a few are the push type that attach to your cylinder. One or two models even switch back and forth. And bear in mind that these DPV categories, while useful, are generalizations, with many models falling in between them with respect to features and uses. Regardless of type, all DPVs have five basic components, though they may vary in their specifics. All DPVs have a trigger or control mechanism. They all have a propeller and a shroud or housing that lets water through, but reduces the risk of entangling gear or debris in the prop. They all have handles that range from basic carrying handles to grips you hang on to while driving the scooter. All have a way of accessing the battery for recharging and or for replacement and maintenance and all have buoyancy characteristics that make them nearly neutral, ranging from slightly positive to slightly negative. A few models allow you to adjust their buoyancy by adding or subtracting weights or inflatable buoyancy collars. Besides these features, a DPV will have some or all of several accessories. The first is a battery charger, which you obviously need. It's common to have a lanyard or clip so you can secure your scooter to your BCD or a line, but be sure you can release it quickly in an emergency. Many scooters, especially tech models, have toe straps or T-bars. These clip to your BCD or create a seat or handle 
so you ride the DPV without tiring your arms. A transportation case of some kind can be important for traveling by air. Other accessories include mounting plates for still or video camera housings. In selecting a DPV, there are 11 features to consider. There are no right or wrong options in these features, but rather choices you make based upon the kind of diving you do. The most basic feature is rugged construction. Most scooters are very sturdy, but some stand up to more abuse than others. Seals are a consideration because the more there are, the more potential leaks you have and the more O-rings you have to maintain. Most modern designs try to minimize the number of required seals. Batteries affect the runtime on a single charge, and as you'll learn more about shortly, the size, price, and weight of the vehicle. Variable speed is more desirable than you may imagine. This is because you and your buddy can fine-tune your DPVs so you cruise smoothly together at the same pace. Maximum depth is a consideration if you're a tech diver or plan to become one. Several excellent recreational scooters aren't rated to tech diving depths. You typically hold the trigger mechanism for extended durations, so it should be comfortable in your hand. Some types use a magnet that activates an internal trigger, which eliminates another seal and potential leak point. The buoyancy of a DPV will be typically close to neutral with a slight positive buoyancy in salt water and a slight negative buoyancy in fresh. Adjustable buoyancy lets you make the vehicle float, sink, or be almost exactly neutral, depending upon what you need during a dive. Weight out of water is usually a trade you make with run duration. It's not a major issue for most boat diving and many shore diving situations, but it can be a consideration if you'll need to haul your DPV a long distance or you plan to fly with it a lot. Finally, consider what accessories are important and choose a scooter that has them available. When you choose a DPV, it will come with one of several types of rechargeable batteries. Your instructor will go over some of the advantages of the different types, and you can find more information in the PADI Diver Propulsion Vehicle Manual. Setting up your DPV for a dive varies with the make and model. You'll follow the manufacturer's instructions for your specific model, but most scooters generally follow the same steps. Start with a freshly charged battery. Clean, lubricate, and replace all user-accessible O-rings. Be sure O-rings and their grooves are clean, and to lightly lubricate the O-rings as directed by the manufacturer. Note that a few models have a compression o-ring that should not be lubricated, so be sure to check the manufacturer's literature. Some scooters have a small port for recharging, for use in disassembly, and in some cases, for allowing gases to vent after assembly. Be sure to clean the o-rings and replace the port plug before diving. After you've fully assembled your DPV, quickly trigger it to confirm operation. Don't run it for long, though because most DPVs are not designed for continuous use in air, but rely on water for lubrication and to carry away heat. Watch that the propeller turns in the correct direction. Running backwards may indicate incorrect battery hookup or other problem. When you're sure everything's right, engage the trigger lock, if your scooter has one. Transport it securely out of direct sunlight. On a dive boat, be sure to tie or otherwise secure it so it can't roll or fall. Not only would doing so likely damage it, it can hurt people tumbling loose on a boat. Like your other dive gear, the first step after a dive is to rinse your DPV thoroughly in fresh water. Ideally, you want to immerse it fully sealed and run the propeller in one or two short bursts. Don't forget to replace the port plug if your scooter has one. Gently agitate it for two or three minutes to flush out any salt water or debris. Due to their size, however, it's not always possible to immerse a DPV. In such a case, rinse it with a hose using fresh, gently running water. Dry your DPV, open it, 
and recharge the battery as soon as possible after use. If you won't be diving for a while, store it according to manufacturer's guidelines. Usually this means putting it away disassembled in a cool, dry place, out of direct sunlight, with user-accessible O-rings removed. DPV batteries require your attention if you want them to last. Keep lead-acid batteries upright for charging. Always recharge the batteries only with the manufacturer-specified charger. Using the wrong charger, even of the same voltage, can damage the battery, the charger, and present a fire hazard. Always connect the battery to the charger before you plug it in. And after recharging, unplug it first, then disconnect the battery. Be sure you connect the correct leads when you hook the battery to the charger or DPV. Many models use one-way connectors to prevent problems with this. Also, don't smoke or allow open flames near charging batteries because they release hydrogen gas. Charge in a ventilated area and wait at least 30 minutes after charging, longer if specified by the manufacturer, before sealing the battery in your scooter. Finally, check that the local power is compatible with your charger when traveling internationally with your DPV. Avoid completely discharging the batteries, especially lead-acid ones. When you note a significant power drop-off, stop using your scooter until you recharge it. Don't delay recharging your batteries. They last longer when kept charged. So be sure to charge them as soon as possible, ideally within 24 hours or less. Regardless of type, Realize that rechargeable batteries wear out and lose performance, and you have to replace them periodically. You prolong your battery and charger life by keeping them as cool as possible, though very cold temperatures make recharging times take longer. Most chargers are vulnerable to saltwater damage, so recharge batteries in a cool, dry area. Some batteries require periodic charging when you don't use them for extended periods, or they'll cease to work at all. Recharge batteries monthly or as specified by the manufacturer. For maximum performance and useful life, always follow specific manufacturer instructions for recharging your DPV batteries. Air travel with your DPV has some important considerations. Begin by separating the DPV and battery. The battery may need to travel in the scooter, but disconnect the leads. Note that some types of batteries may not be flown on commercial air carriers. This is generally not an issue with sealed lead-acid batteries, nickel-cadmium, or nickel-metal hydride. But check with the airline if you're not sure about your specific batteries. Pack your DPV in an appropriate case to protect it from the rigors of baggage handling. Depending upon the weight and how many other bags you have, be prepared to pay excess baggage fees. For excess baggage rates, check with the airline. Also, don't be surprised if security personnel want to look at your DPV. They look a lot like bombs under x-ray. Now let's look at some ways DPV diving differs from diving without one and how this affects your dive planning and how you dive. One of the most important considerations is determining a turnaround point. You already plan when you will turn the dive based on your air use and no stop time and other limits. And with a scooter, you also have to plan for battery power. You don't want to drag a failed DPV a long way back to the boat. The only sure way to know your scooter's range is to run it until it begins to slow noticeably. The ideal way to do this is in a pool, orbiting a boat, or some other place where you can run it down without having a long swim to your exit. Do this wearing the same gear you normally use diving. In a pinch, you can do a static in-water test, though it won't be quite as accurate because you won't have the same load on the motor. Note the runtime and record it on the battery itself, along with the test date. Since batteries lose their capacity over time, you'll need to conduct this test periodically. Your turnaround point will be based on your burn test. 
As a rule of thumb, use one-third of the available time going outward, one-third for returning, and one-third for reserve. The reserve is important because it's impossible to account for all the factors that can drain the batteries. And don't forget your no-stop and air supply limits. During the dive, you need to watch the actual time you spend running your DPV. Although you can track the actual time running with a digital watch on stopwatch mode, on many dives, it's far simpler just to treat the entire dive as runtime. Plan your dive so that you always have enough air and no stop time so that you could make it to your exit point towing your scooter. Dive headed into the current just as you would if you were swimming so that the flow assists your return whether the scooter's towing you or you're towing it. Plan DPV dives so you see a wider area rather than to go farther than you can reasonably swim. If you get back to your exit area with extra burn time, air, and no stop time, you can usually use it scootering and exploring the immediate area. When planning a repetitive dive, subtract the total times from previous dives from your test time. Divide the remaining time by three to determine your turnaround point. If you can partially charge lead acid or nickel metal hydride batteries between dives, great, but it's nearly impossible to calculate how much you gain from a short charge. If you don't have a spare fresh battery, the best bet is to disregard it and let it add to your reserve. You can change depth very rapidly with a DPV, which, as you should realize, isn't a good idea. You want to descend and ascend slowly so you don't have equalization problems on the way down. And so you don't risk lung overexpansion injuries or exceeding a safe ascent rate on the way up. Descend and ascend under power very gradually by sloping very gently. Equalize and adjust your buoyancy early and often. Watch your rate closely, especially ascending. If necessary, cut power and stop if you need to equalize while descending, or to control your buoyancy on the way up. Gradual power descents and descents work well at dive sites that have topography you can follow from shallow to deeper water and back. When you don't have a gradual reference to follow, it's often easier to control descents and ascents if you don't try to use the DPV. Instead, just scooter on the bottom and clip it to your gear or tow it with one hand for descents and ascents. Don't forget to make a safety stop at 5 meters or 15 feet when you come up. When planning your dive, you and your buddies should discuss how you'll descend and ascend with your DPVs. You can tandem ride many DPVs, and we'll look at this in more detail shortly. But generally, it's best for each diver to have a DPV. Because a scooter can carry you away from your buddies rapidly, you need to discuss how you'll stay together as part of your dive plan. The usual technique is for a specific diver to lead. Buddies follow either in a triangular delta formation or single file. When DPVs have different speeds, the slowest diver usually goes first. Though if you have variable speed DPVs, you can usually fine tune